Thanks for joining us. We are in a series called Some Assembly Required. We're trying to figure out how to put together healthy homes, healthy families. And of course, last week, we gave a key talk about quality homes are oftentimes led by quality leaders. We talked about the importance of leadership in the home. If you missed that, you're going to go back. Uh, go to our website, newwalk.church. We've got all of the archives there. Catch it on YouTube as well. And just say, man, what? What does quality leadership in the home look like? That was last week. This week I've got some keys to assembling quality homes. Before I get to that, I want to just take time to celebrate last week at our church. You know, we had a back-to-school bash, and uh, I don't know if you know this, we had 10 people say yes to Jesus Christ. They crossed over, <laughs> crossed over from death to life, and we are excited about that. We had 100, over 100 first-time visitors last week to our church is awesome. And uh, in our kids' ministry, I thought this was really cool. We had almost 500 kids in our kids' ministry last week. So <laughs> uh, pray for them. Anyways, uh, that was a busy time. Hey, uh, I do want to give one announcement. Actually, right after this service at 1 o'clock, I'm going to be in the cafe. Uh, my wife and I, we're leading a trip in the year 2024 um, to, to Israel. And uh, it's going to be in the spring of 2024. We've actually for several years now, we've been trying to go to Israel. Um, we had it planned, I think, for 2020, and then there was COVID. And then we moved it to 2021, and then there was COVID. <laughs> and, 20, and so anyways, we think we're, we're ready. Israel's open. Everything's moving forward. So we're going to try again. And hopefully, uh, maybe you'd want to go on that trip. Maybe you're interested in finding out more information about this trip that my wife and I are leading. We would love to tell you about it. You can go to the cafe right after church. I'd spend about 45 minutes together explaining to you about the trip. You can kind of see if it's something you want to start saving for and being a part of. If you're not able to make it and you're still interested, you can go to the connect table on the way out on the left-hand side, there's a connect table, really long table in the hallway, and there's a staff there, team. They are able to give you information about anything going on in the church, but they can give you a little brochure, a little thing about, about the um, trip to Israel as well. When we consider families, what we're really doing is taking time in our time together to learn some keys to quality families. And in our culture today, if you want to learn about quality homes and families, let's be honest, you're not, you're not getting it from media or culture. Like, you're not going to get information through the media, through, through shows that are online, through, through uh, people today. Not many people are talking about quality homes, quality families. Hollywood's not producing, you know, movies regularly anymore about quality families versus maybe decades ago. In fact, oftentimes the shows we watch that feature families, they make a mockery of families. They make a joke of the dad in the home, make him look like an imbecile. They you know, make a mockery of, of just family unit we see in our culture today. People downgrading, talking about it's not important anymore. Well, look, if you want to know the truth about healthy families, it would be smart for any of us in here to go to the one place that's the most valuable, go to the source of the one who made families, God, and find out what he says about really what healthy quality homes ought to be. And that's what we're going to do in our time together. Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 and 24. It says this, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. A couple things I see right there in God's word is he made the family, he designed it, he set it up, and he, it's the desire for God to see it to be, to be healthy and unification. That's a portrait of healthiness and, and, and oneness. Look, the truth is, is all of us were made to have relationships. We're all made to have healthy relationships. God wants that for all of us, and he certainly wants that for us within the bounds of marriage as well. For some of you, though, your home life growing up, it, it wasn't something that you learned good information from, right? If we were to say, like, we learned from God, and then let's just say we learned from healthy homes that we grew up in, how to have healthy homes. If I said to you, you learned how to have a healthy home because you grew up in a healthy home, some of you would say, uh, that didn't happen. 
at all. Like your idea of home is described in two words, bed and breakfast, and that was about it. You know, that, that was about what you did at home. You had a bed and you maybe ate at home and the rest of the time maybe you didn't even want to be home. And so it wasn't a healthy home. But that doesn't mean we're, we're left going, okay, well, you know, I guess I'll just never be able to have a healthy home myself because I didn't learn a healthy home growing up. You know, it's, it's all over for me now. No, you, you can still learn. You can still dig into God's word. You can still learn key truths. We're doing that here today. I thought I'd give you four words that I think we could utilize to, to describe a home that's been assembled well. Maybe you go through these today and you say, well, I didn't do one, two, three, four, all four of these well. I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's not going well right now at your home. It doesn't mean you just throw your hands up in the air. You say, okay, I'm gonna leave here today, take some steps to start getting this right. Let me give you the first word I wanted to give you today. It's the word shelter. Healthy families have a home that's like a shelter. We sang about storms, Ryan up here singing earlier about storms and and I, I've said many times here, I'll say it again, you and I are gonna have storms in life. It's not a matter of if but when. And healthy homes allow us to come back each day into a place where though it was chaotic outside the doors of the home, now I, I'm here and I'm in a safe I'm in a safe shelter place. Healthy homes have stable environments. Healthy homes have consistent environments. Healthy homes are secure. They are a place of protection. And you and I know a lot of homes today are not that. And so what happens is the child goes out of the home. The spouse goes out of the home, opens the door. It's chaos there. We know it's chaos. And then they come back home, into the home, and it's chaos. That's not God's design, though, for, for a healthy home. In Proverbs 14, 20, or, or sorry, I'll get to Proverbs 14, well, I'll give you this now. Here's what I wrote or put down this scripture. Reverence for the Lord gives a man deep strength. I, I love what it says here. His children have a place of, what's that, what's that next word? His children have a place of what? And what's the next one? Security. Does that define the home you grew up in? Does that define the home you're in right now? Refuge. Security. Let me give you three things we need to have refuge and security. We need shelter from. I'll give you three. Here's the first one. Change. We live in a world now more than ever where things are just changing and shifting. Uh, pe what people see as truth and not truth and people's ideas and culture and all that stuff. It's constantly changing. Uh, not to mention, you know, some of the things that are just always going to be a part of life. Uh, life changing in general. Uh, stages of life. Uh, death in the family, uh, you know, and extended family situations at times, changing jobs and all the things that are going on, and those changes, you come home to a very committed and consistent environment. Is your home consistent despite the change going on in the world today? The second word I put down to talk about shelter, and we need shelter from failures, Failure is, is a storm. Failure is something that all of us in life deal with. I, I know we live in a time today where they say, hey, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody's a winner. No, they're not. You lose sometimes. You just do. Sometimes you don't make the team. Sometimes you lose the game. Sometimes you don't get the job you applied for. Sometimes you didn't get the raise you thought you'd get, the promotion. We don't always win. And again, we could face difficulties outside the home. Though we're having a losing stretch or a losing situation outside the home, we come into the home and we say, okay, but that's the place where my biggest fans are. And they're cheering me on despite some of the difficulty that we are facing outside of the home. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and 9, I love this translation. It says it like this, two are better than one. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just too bad because there's no one to help him. In, in togetherness of relationships, we connect with people who can help cheer us on. Your greatest fans, though, should be inside the home. Here's the third one. It's rejection. 
I would say this is the most difficult thing that we need shelter from. This is the most difficult thing you and I face in life is when somebody rejects us. Uh, you were cut down, you were ridiculed, you were criticized. Somebody said they, 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 they didn't want you around. Rejection starts sometimes at a very early age on the playground. Some of the most cruel things a child can face is in school when a kid at school treats them a certain way. They can be able to come home, be built back up and strengthened in our time today. More kids are in broken homes and they're dealing with messiness in their life. They don't understand what a healthy home is and then they go to school. And that brokenness that they're encountering at home they're putting on kids at school. Those kids, and, they, and some of it gets on your kids, and some of you have experienced what it's like to have some of that brokenness reach the kids in your home. Our kids have to be able to come home despite the messiness at school or wherever it may be, come home and say, now this is a place where you are loved. I, I saw a quote one time that said, if you don't believe kids have a sin nature inside of them, just become a teacher once and you'll discover some of the things kids are capable of doing now more than ever. The breakups, the times where you're treated poorly. No, I've got an environment I can come back to. I can cry on somebody's shoulder and I can know that they're still for me. Is your home a shelter? Is your home demonstrating love in a broken world? This is why divorce is so painful. Because what it does is it takes the very storms that our kids are facing outside the home and now it's inside the home. And there's no shelter or safe place for them. I think we underestimate what it does to our children. I, I will say this though, look, we have many people in this audience right now, uh, you've gone through a divorce and a New Walk Church is a no condemnation house. We're glad you're here, divorced, whatever, single, glad you're here. And so I'm sharing with you something to say, okay, you know what? Missed out on that opportunity to have a healthy marriage. But with God's help, if, if, if he gives me an opportunity to be married again, we'll make sure, we're going to make sure that that relationship is stable. And if there's kids around, it provides a shelter for them. Uh, the next word I put down is prepare. Healthy homes prepare. They prepare you for life. You're teaching, you're helping, you're equipping things of God, but not just things of God. Like the, the, little, the little details that a parent teaches a kid about life, the medium kind of details, the big things about life as well. Like We're constantly teaching. We don't ever take the foot off the pedal, teaching, 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 equipping, because one day they are going to exit. And so naturally, any good parent would want their kid to be the best prepared they could possibly be. Psalm 144, verse 12. May our sons in their youth be like plants that grow up strong. You know, many times the family is correlated to, it's correlation to gardening. You take care of it. You, you take care of it you t in hopes that it produces fruit one day. And you do your part to invest in that plant or that garden. And we do that with our kids. So they grow up and be healthy people in society and in life and make a difference around them. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in training and in what? Instruction of the Lord. That's what families do. There are three critical stages to parenting. I didn't put them in your notes, but I, they're in my notes. One, parental control. That's where your kids are too young and you just get, you got to assert a, a parental control over them uh, until it's time to really, to really start to give them a little bit of freedom. And that brings you to the next stage, which is called self-control. You start giving them opportunity to test, make some decisions, uh, test the things going on that, that are going on in this world. And then ultimately, you release them to God's control. We send them out of the house, and you know what, God, they're yours. I did my part, and now they're left to these decisions and choices to make every day in their life. And Parents do that, and, and, and they bring themselves to a place of God control because they're constantly training, constantly equipping. I, I love what it says in Luke 2, uh, verse 52, about Jesus and his, his growth. Look what it says. 
four ways Jesus grew. Jesus grew, we underlined them, in wisdom, stature, in favor with God, and with man. Well, that's four things you should want for your kid. Grow in wisdom, that's intellectual growth. Stature, that's physical growth. Favor with God, that's spiritual growth. And favor with man, that's social, relational connectivity or growth. Every family should probably want that for their kids, and it happens through this consistent training. But I put in your notes three areas you definitely need to focus on to have healthy homes. Within the home, no matter how many people are in the home, if it's just a married couple, if it's, if it's more, if it's kids as well, homes is where you learn about relationships. Many of you, you learn how to relate to humanity as an adult. You, now, as an adult, you learned relational skills from your home. The number one area a child learns about relationships is from the behavior and the way their mother and father relate to people, related to one another. For some of you, you learned quality relationships from your mother and father. Some of you, it, you didn't learn well from them. There were, for some of you, very ineffective communication skills and ability to relate you're by your parents. Others of you, you watch that go very well and now you've taken that out of the home into your, into your life. When we are building strong relationships in the home, when we model, hey, things are tough at times, but we're gonna work through it because that person is worth fighting for and they mean a lot to me. And, and when we model quick forgiveness in the midst of difficulty, our kids see that. They exit the home and they, they understand better relationships and they utilize that in their own families one day. I think we gotta pay attention, those of you who didn't learn quality relationships in the home from your mother and father. Take seriously how that has impacted your ability to have good relationships. You know, therapists, psychologists will say this. The number one factor in determining your healthiness of your life outside of spiritual things is how well you do in life's relationships because they're such a big part of life. People that have happy, healthy relationships are happier in life. People who have broken relationships in life are unhappy in life. And so if you didn't learn this well growing up, get help. Of course, you're not left on an island. You, you can go to God's word and learn what good relationships are. You can also get help from therapists, psychologists, help you say, okay, you, this is what you learned growing up, but this is what you need to be doing in your life now. And if we don't get help, we keep that damaging thing that we learned growing up, we keep damaging people as we become adults, we're just perpetuating this unhealthy cycle for their kids and their kids. The second word I put is character. We learn, and we need to be teaching quality relationships, and we teach character in the home. I'm fortunate to have come from multiple generations of high character families. I'm grateful for that. I certainly learned a lot from the men in my life. And boys do, they, they pick up a lot from men in their life. You know, it's, you've heard it said before, right? Like father, like son. Sons learn a lot from their dads. Daughters learn a lot from their dads. Daughters and sons learn a lot from their moms as well. But we're teaching, whether we know it or not, we're teaching every day character to our kids. You say, kids, kids, we are an honest family. We are always going to be honest with people. There's no lies in our home. Bill collector calls. Don't answer the phone. We don't talk to them. We don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Avoid them. Avoid them. Coming at the door to collect money. Don't answer the door. We're just going to stay right here. I'm just saying, like, we, we send signals and little things and big things on, on character. We're teaching that. We, we ought to teach values as well. Healthy families teach, hopefully, Healthy values. It's, it's, it's in a home where you teach the values of work and labor and providing for a family. It's, it's in a home that you learn the truth about how to handle your time and time management and 
life skills like that, how to handle your money and how to value money, how to value playtime, how to value work time. It's where you learn the truth about uh, what sex is and what sex is not. And you learn those things in, in a quality home. They're taught there consistently. It's where you're taught about the things of God and the value of having a relationship with your heavenly Father. Uh, Isaiah 38 and verse 19 puts it very plainly in this translation. It says, one generation makes known your faithfulness to the next. When it comes to things spiritual, when it comes to anything in life, when parents are teaching, they are involved in something that's like a relay race. I'm taking the baton of all the things I learned from previous generations in my life and from my parents. I'm receiving it and I'm involved in a thing where I'm about to pass it on to my kids. What values are you passing on to your kids. You've been influenced, and now you are influencing others. I do want to talk about spiritual things that we pass on to our kids, though. This is so important, and I, I see in our culture today more and more of a, a movement that says, well, you know what? I'm, in fact, I've heard these words. Pastor Gary, I, I just don't feel like I need to impose my spiritual values on my kids. I'm just going to let them decide for themselves. I've heard that. Maybe some of you have said those words. And if you don't mind, I want to give you a very theological response to that statement. If, you, if it's okay. I'm gonna, here it is. Bull crap. <laughs> that, that's it. You don't leave spiritual teaching to somebody else. They're in your home, man. They live under your roof, and so you're taking time. You don't abdicate that role. You teach them spiritual values. Will there come a time one day when they exit the home and they've got to make their decisions, and, and, but you want to give them a foundation? Absolutely. If you're not teaching your family about God, you are making a major mistake that has potential eternal implications for their life. Pay attention to this. Do your part. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says... These commands, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Why don't we do this anymore? You know, I'll tell you why. Because we don't walk along the road with them anymore. You know, we don't set time. Be by their bedside and pray over them and teach them some things about God before they go to bed. When they wake up in the morning, we don't wake up and tell them things about God or pray with them, whatever it may be. Instead, we give them a tablet and tell them to watch something. You know, studies say that the generations coming up now will spend a full 10 years in front of a screen by the time they're dead. 10 years. Think about it like this. That's 10 years in front of a screen. If you take your kid to church, that's all you do spiritually for them, which twice, let's say you do it twice a week. Maybe they go to student ministry for an hour on Wednesday. Maybe they come here for an hour on Sunday, that's two hours a week. Two hours a week over 18 years maybe adds up to four months of their life. Four months of investment versus 10 years in front of a screen. That's why we don't just bring our kids to church and that's a great first step and I, if you're just doing that now, great. But we go home and teach as well. We go home and teach spiritual values to our kids as well. And we accumulate the hours laying the foundation so that when they, lay, when they leave the home, that baton is being passed in a healthy way. How are you doing in preparation in your home right now? It's one of the reasons why I do a podcast three days a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I do a podcast. And it's just I spend time, about 10 minutes an episode, just teaching men some of the things that they maybe didn't get taught when they were growing up. It's why I do a men's gathering here in the cafe on um, uh, the new round of groups. So I'll, I'll do another level line of teaching and it'll be uh, the starting the last Thursday in September in our new round of groups. I'll be in there in the cafe. Uh, every man in the church is invited to be a part of that. And I just download to men man-to-man -man things that I've learned that I needed to know, things that men need to know in general that maybe they weren't taught when they were when they were growing up about how to be a healthier man. Here's the third thing. Healthy families, they play. They have fun. 
They celebrate. They party a little bit at times. They have a good time. And I share this to say, say I share this for this reason to say this. I, I just got through talking about preparation, teaching and instructing. And now we're talking about also enjoying time together. See, there's a balance there in teaching as well as enjoying. Some of you know how messy this can get because you grew up in a home where it was just teaching boot camp in home 247 and it was never fun. There's got to be a balance. You, you don't want to be in a home where it's party all the time either because again, there's got to be training and instruction but homes, families should have fun together. First of all, uh, you're married, Ecclesiastes 9.9, 9, enjoy life with your wife whom you love. Enjoy. Spend time together. We get caught up in money, careers, jobs, bills. Have fun together. Proverbs 5.19 translation says, be happy with your wife and find your joy with the girl you married. Enjoying time together. But you've probably heard it said before. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that says, a family that prays together, what? Stays together. I've always said this. You could add to it. A family that plays together stays together. A family has fun together. They have a richness of fond, fond memories, good times that they once had. And I said this on my podcast a few months ago, and I'll say it again. If you don't have fun with your kids and in your household, don't be surprised when they grow up if they don't ever want to come back and visit. Because it wasn't fun to be in the home. Healthy homes provide a place where the kids say, I want to come back and visit mom and dad. I enjoyed being around them. Psalm 127 verse 3, children are a gift from God. They are his reward. Children are like sharp arrows. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. There's a joy in having children, so taking time to enjoy them. I've become increasingly aware that my time with, with my girls, my kids in my home, it, it's, it's coming to an end. One has just left. It's gone to be married, and the other one is in college and wanting to move away and move away to a college soon. And so my time is running out, but we've been intentional about spending time together. As a matter of fact, now, you know, many times over the years I've taught about family and how I do things and my kids have been kind of young, but now that they're kind of in college or out of the home, I thought I would bring them out and let you just hear from them about some of the things that we were really focused on as a family. So I'm gonna have my daughters come out along with my wife and just wanna share with you for about eight or 10 minutes some things that maybe were valuable to them. This is my oldest daughter, Sydney. She just got married and ditched me. All right, so there's that. And then my youngest daughter, Brooke, again, she's started college, and uh, my wife, Sean, as well. And so uh, just a few things that, that they've picked up from over the years of being in our home. You know, many times a pastor might, he might talk about how, oh, yeah, we, you know, our family this or that, but can the kids really testify to it? Uh, I, the, my kids can, I think. <laughs> we'll see how they do here, but... Uh, I think that they can share that, you know, what Pastor Gary talked about here on the stage was a part of our home and our family. Sydney, uh, well, Sean, I think you wanted to say something real quick before we get started. Before we get started, I do want to clarify, we are not perfect parents. Some days we were not even good parents. Um, but uh, So don't put us up on a pedestal, but today we're sharing some of our highlight reels, some of the things that we feel like we did well over the years, so... Yeah, and just I wanted to clarify. I did give them the freedom. I, you said you bring to the table a couple of things each that were important to y'all. And, and we really, only thing we kind of rehearsed was where we'd be on the stage and mic checks, things like that. So it was really uh, their job to come up with a couple of things that were valuable for them. And so, Sydney, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you already talked about this a little bit, but that stability of having a home as a safe place to come home to, um, that was something that... They did really well and I really appreciated because we were out, you know, at school and throughout our days and it was chaos. There's craziness that the world brings, but then we have this safe space that we can come home to that's consistently that same space. Um, it was calm. We knew that we could have a bad day and we could walk through the doors and we could just take a breath of fresh air and know that our parents were here and they had our backs. 
And um, something that built up that consistency was um, praying together every night and having dinners together every night. Um, that consistency was always good to know that we had every single night together. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, was always, I think, in our minds was you were learning what a good marriage was every day. You were learning what a good husband and father was, what a good wife and mother was. And so I think we were always mindful that we were teaching every day. We were teaching, teaching. And uh, you guys were picking up on those things. And you would take things out of the home one day. And by how we did, yeah. that would be your example for how you operated with marriage and family. Okay, um, let's see, Brooke? Yeah, so one thing that I would say is very beneficial to me and Sydney is that my parents were very intentional with their time with us. They, you know, they always had busy schedules, but they were intentional about planning times to hang out as a family. And when we did hang out, they were present, they were there, they weren't like working or on their phones the whole time. They were really intentional with us. Uh, one of the ways that they did this is through establishing traditions in our family. And these could be like a family trip or even just like a family day. For us, family days were Mondays and we might would go out to breakfast or we'd have like a family game night. And those were just some things that I could look forward to, some things that I could count on. Another thing is my dad uh, with me and my sister from middle school through high school, on Friday mornings, we would have donut days, and before school, he would take us out to breakfast, and I could count on this tradition. While he might have had like 50 things to do that Friday, he was setting aside that time and being intentional with it. Yeah, uh, we, we did those, and, and you mentioned traditions, and I think this is a key element to healthy homes, where, so once a week, there are traditions, my, things that we do in the home that my kids can count on, once a month, and, you know, over the year, other things as well. So annual things, monthly things, and weekly things so that they, they know that these are consistencies in, in our home. And that was big for Sean and I, traditions. And, and it's, you know, we wanted to pass that baton on to them as well. Yeah, one of our, one thing I think we've mentioned a few times is dinner. I grew up in the South, so dinner time was really important to That's us. Important, she's clarified. I know some of you have asked, if she's from New York, and so it's just, she's from the South, so just to clarify that, go ahead. <laughs> if anybody needs a translator, just let me know. <laughs> now, we grew up in the South, and dinner time was important. It was always a, a good time. It was um, joy, and we shared our day, and, um, you know, I say everything was deep fried, so that just made it extra special. <laughs> um, so that was important. So when we got married, we set that. Gary came from a family. They ate dinner together every night. So that was definitely from day one of our marriage. And then as we had kids, it was very important and very intentional. Um, and beyond that, I think something else we did well is as often as we could, we would bring the community into our home. So even when the girls were in elementary school, we would have the play dates at our house. We would invite kids over. And that gave us an avenue to help them navigate different personalities, different, uh, different people that they hadn't encountered, or maybe kids with different values so that they could kind of see if, if they fit with where they were going, or we could help them just navigate how to have conversations with kids that, that maybe were different than us, like with their values or the way they spoke or whatever. Um, so we did that as often as we could on Fridays when Gary did the donuts. He would even um, invite as many kids as he could to join them at, around for donuts. So we did that a lot. But then when the boys started coming around, um, and Gary was completely against these boys talking to his little princesses, um, we had to talk through that. And uh, he wanted just to push them all away and just lock the doors of the house. But... Um, I convinced him it was better to bring the boys into our home, bring them over for our dinner times, over for our game nights and stuff, so that the girls could see if these guys' values lined up with our values or the directions they were wanting to go. Yes, begrudgingly, we did that. We did that. Um, now, uh, you mentioned something about the, the dinners together. And we, so I, just, I would say this. If you're looking for simple steps... Um, Pray together, play together, eat together. 
Three important steps that are part of healthy homes. I know not everybody can. I know that uh, some of you work schedule, somebody literally works at night. So maybe you have another meal you can do together. Get that 20, 30 minutes together around the table, which was so important. Uh, but many of us can do that. And we just, we're just going in different directions. You bring that all together and say, no, we're going to fight for family dinner time. And Sean was really good at fighting for that for our family. What else, Sydney? Yeah, you guys, uh, growing up, you kept our uh, family environment very fun. You fostered this fun-loving um, thing that, like, everything we did together was fun. And so as we grew up and got older, we started to really enjoy our time together. Um, we enjoy spending time together, and um, we have a lot of fun. And I've enjoyed that now, growing up. And now that I'm in this new season of life where I've moved out, um, they've created such a fun environment that I literally live down the street from them, and I work with them every day, so I clearly don't want to leave. Um, but I remember as a kid, like, um, choosing to want to spend time with my family over things with my friends just because I just really love being around my family, and we're all really, really close now that we've gotten older. Good, yeah. Uh, and Brooke, you had... Something there. Yeah, so another really big thing is that my parents followed through on their word. Uh, for example, if they said, hey, Brooke, we're going to come to your game tonight, I was not sitting there thinking, well, are they actually going to show up or they might not actually come, but they were there and I wasn't ever wondering like if they wouldn't because I knew they would follow through on their words and their commitments. If they said, we're going to hang out as a family this week, I knew we would hang out as a family. It wasn't even a question if we wouldn't because I could trust their word. Yeah, I think there's a value in, you know, if you can make your kids' events, be there. And again, sometimes there's people who got to work, but trying to find, the, committing to say, we're going to be there, we're going to watch. There's a value. A kid looks up in the stands or out in the audience, sees mom and dad there, uh, following through on their word to be there and to watch them and whatever it is they're doing. Yeah, we not only follow through with the good things that we promised our kids, but we also follow through on discipline and consequences. So we made expectations very clear, and then um, we, we follow through on the discipline. And that was hard. That was probably the hardest thing as a parent, was following through on the discipline side of it. But we had, um, we never intended to be our, our kids' friends. Like we knew our job was to parent them parent, and invest yeah. them and raise them and let them know that we had their back and hopefully they believed that we wanted the best for them so they could trust us as, as we helped guide them through growing up. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the friendship thing has, has kind of developed, but it, yeah, it was our, it was our goal to parent, that was, a, that was the number one thing we did. And, and that discipline thing has to be unified. Sometimes there's good cop, bad cop situation in the home with a, a husband, wife, mom, dad, and it had to be unified. And, um, <laughs> you know, them, as these are daddy's girls. I remember Sean coming to me when they were very little saying, uh, we, okay, we don't leave me out here hanging out to dry. Like, okay, like we're going to be in this together. And so I had to realize how important that was to say, though, you know, I want to be, these be daddy's girls. When it's time to draw the line, I had to be right there, you know, together with her, uh, unified on that. Okay, you had one last thing? Yeah, um, one thing in the broader uh, scale of things that you guys did was you gave us the freedom to fail and the freedom to make our own choices. And um, that's something that was really important as we got older. Um, you guys set a firm foundation. There were some things we didn't get a choice on, like coming to church and serving. That was a non-negotiable with our family. And they set a firm foundation um, on those expectations for us. But uh, one thing that they couldn't choose for us is our relationship with Christ. And so that was something that my sister and I had to choose for ourselves. Even though our dad's a pastor, doesn't make us automatically have that decision. And so uh, we came to make that decision for our life. And with that comes our own personal walk with Christ. And so as we got older, my parents understood they weren't going to be there to help us make decisions as we went into public school and got older and that they could only set the foundation. And so when they set that foundation, it allowed us um, to then not make choices out of this is what my parents say or this is what, you know, is right or wrong, but based out of like, will this choice grow us closer to God or will it take us away from our relationship with God? And so that was something that uh, became important as we got older. And then you guys knew that 
you know, we're human and we're gonna make choices that aren't the greatest. And so having that safe space again to come back to when we fail or make a wrong choice and getting to be able to freely share that and you guys help walk us through that decision. It's a part of that journey of release under parental control, then giving them some self-control and then handing them off to God's control, just kind of letting the line loose a little bit so they can test those decisions. All right, um, thank you all. I'm gonna close out uh, with this last point and they're gonna exit off the stage. Thank you, ladies. Well, the last thing I wanted you to put in your notes that I think is so valuable to healthy homes, it's, uh, I, I wrote the word prayer or pray, to pray. Families that are, are healthy do pray pray, but it's more than that. And you might write this next word right next to that. The prayer together develops into ministry together. <clears throat> Let me explain what I mean is I've spent time explaining to my kids that they're going to discover one day that money doesn't last, possessions don't last, but relationships matter and, and that there's something they can do with their life that leaves a legacy a lasting legacy that lasts forever and ever. And that's when they take the things that dad has taught them spiritually and apply it outside of themselves into helping others. First Corinthians chapter six and verse 15 says this, Stephanus and his family were the first to become Christians in Greece and they are spending their lives, look, their family spending their lives helping and serving Christians everywhere. I talked last week about how great leaders unify and unified families, oftentimes when it comes to the things of God, they're flowing together for the things of God. They're moving on a journey. They're moving on a journey together. They're not, again, as I said last week, you know, husband going this way, wife going this way, one kid over here, another kid over there. They're, they're unified, including for, including the things of serving and helping others. Uh, Acts 16, the whole family was filled with joy because they had come to believe they'd come to believe in God Acts 10 2 at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment he and his family were devout God fearing he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly you see this movement of unity together where the family is journeying and serving serving Together, I love that because I've been able to watch and we come to church and we find that service to worship together our family, but we go in our ways to serve as well. There's a, a neat thing you can encounter here at New Walk or any church is there's certain serve teams where you can all be, as a family, be on the same serve team. Or maybe you go off into to multiple serve teams, but then the second service, you come back, like this service, and, and then you worship together. And doing this as a family is a, is a critical part of a family healthiness. It's been a part of the healthiness of our journey. Our family is serving, not swerving. We're moving together to help people. I want to just say this last thing before I close in prayer. If you're here today and you're single, anytime single people hear a message like this or maybe uh, you're, you're widowed, maybe uh, you're divorced, you're single though, let's say, uh, however you look at that, single people will hear a message like this and in a few years from now when they maybe enter into a relationship, they either come back and say, Pastor Gary, I remembered those things that you taught and now they are helping me in my relationship. Or they say, that didn't really apply to me, I was single. It's one of the two, so I would challenge you single people to take this and say, okay, when those opportunities come my way and in relationships, I'm gonna take these things that I've learned so that I can do it right. But single people, don't ever discount the influence you have right now for relatives, family members, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, whoever may be alive and your ability to to help them on, on their spiritual journey, your ability to influence them and, and have healthy relationships with them. But I'll also say this to single people. If you are a Christian, do you realize that the church family provides everything I just shared? You can get plugged in to a family, a family of choice, 
and do these very things that I, I've just shared. Uh, the church is meant to be a shelter in storms. The church is a learning center, a preparing center for life. The church is a place where you have fun and the fellowship and connectivity with other believers. The church is a launch pad for prayer and spiritual growth and ministry for your own life. And how you help others with the skills and gifts that God has given you. And so you have every opportunity to exercise all of these healthy family attributes in the work of the local church. Let's pray. Uh, we give thanks, God, for another opportunity to learn, grow together, apply these things to our families. We thank you, God, that we're not just left in a place where we didn't, we didn't learn these things growing up and we're just left in a place where it's not gonna ever work out for us. No, 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 we can walk out of here with our head held high knowing, God, that you give us a power and a strength to be better in our lives and for our families. We can dig into you, God, and reverse the situation and hand off a better baton to the next generation. Father, I pray for that. I pray for maybe the unbeliever that's here in our audience. We got a large crowd here this morning. There's somebody here who's not a believer. and I don't know, maybe you grew up in a, a very difficult family situation growing up, but you can be part of a family of choice, a family of God. The Bible says that for all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin for humanity, they have a relationship with the Father and they're a part of the family. And you can take the first step today being a part of the family of God by inviting Christ into your life and accepting his gift for the forgiveness of sin. To have a new life, a new journey, a new future. Begin to apply new things to your own life and to others around you as well. I pray that you'd invite him in today, right where you're seated. Say, God, I accept you. And your son, Jesus Christ, is Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.